please join me in welcoming Glenn, um, Gala, and Brian. Thank you, everybody. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, Gala and Glenn for being here this evening, and also thank Gala once more for making the exhibition that's upstairs with me. If any of you haven't seen it, um, it's okay, there's still time. Um, but I highly recommend it, it'll make much more sense, um, this talk will make much more sense if you've seen it. But um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with um, the two of my co colleagues here on stage because so much of the show um, that we created is really about dialogues between these three parties in the museum world. Um, and so much of it isn't on the wall or so much of it isn't in the brochure. And please pick up one of the brochures if you haven't already. But um, it's in the dialogues that Gala and Glenn and I have been having and have had. And um, it's great to be able to share some of this dialogues with you. So before we sort of get to questions or concerns, um, I wanted the three of us to just talk about um, what is our practice in a way, to think of the three of us as um, some sort of practitioners of the field and to maybe in a short way describe what your practice is like. Okay, hi, thank you for coming. Um, I normally make work with histor historical objects, mainly archeological objects lately. Um, and so I've always had questions about conservation and how these objects exist now in, within institutions. So when Brian invited me to curate a show here, I was like, really the only difference between those objects that I normally look at and the collection here is that the author is still alive. And so I wanted to know, Mocha, as the artist museum, what is the relationship between living artists and the institution and how much say do artists, living artists have over the physical or conceptual shape of their work while they're alive before they die and then curator and conservator will decide all of these things for them. Um, is this on? Okay. Well, I started out as an archeological conservator and, and kind of ending up as an archeological conservator, but I had a, a bit of a journey along the way. I worked in Turkey for many seasons um, on excavations. But I also worked at LACMA and the Getty and, and other museums as a sculpture conservator. I ran a private practice in, in sculpture conservation for a number of years in LA and Santa Barbara. Um, closed it all down to pursue a PhD at the Institute of Archaeology at University College London to develop a model for um, engaging community in the conservation process. But then moved to New York and became the time-based media conservator at, at MoMA. Um, by surprise, <laughs> they, um, the head conservator approached me and said, would you like to do this? And I said, but I know nothing about video and electronic and audio and performance art. And he said, but name one conservator who does. And um, this was back in 2004. So I uh, became the country's first time-based media conservator with the largest collection of, of media art. and. Um, worked with a number of colleagues to, to figure that out. And my practice shifted really from being object-based to being more um, process-based and collaborative, working with artists and others at the museum to build institutional capacity to um, transfer these works to new media, to train, hire and train new performers to reenact uh, works of art. And it just took me into a, a very different place, having started my professional life focusing on materials and deterioration and resins and um, to a place of understanding works where the idea maybe was more important than the material manifestation and building all of this documentation. So when I saw the show here, I just thought, oh, this is, it all comes together because all of the issues that I've been living and breathing for the last 20 years in New York um, are all there on the walls in this exhibition. So I was very excited about that. And I just came back uh, to UCLA about seven months ago to be chair of the archeological, archeology span and ethnographic conservation program. So I've, I've come back and what I'm, I, I like to think that I'm going to try to bring back what I've learned in the world of contemporary art to the 
preservation of traditional material culture and maybe even bring some artists back in to do some creative interventions in, in uh, the, the ideas that we, that we grapple with. Right, so for those of you who may not know, when objects come into the collection or they're acquired or gifted to us, um, there are times when the artist is contacted and that we need to know sort of the parameters of how, and there are other times when that isn't the case. And I think that one of the things that Gal is alluding to and Glenn is too, is that with contemporary art as opposed to you know art from other periods, we have the opportunity to speak to the artist and understand the work that's coming to the collection. And one of the goals of this exhibition was really to um, enunciate and understand what are the parameters, what are the systems that are or aren't in place that allow us to get to know these works and to sort of undo the myth that these are objects that come into the collection and then we have objects rather than relationships with artists. So. Um, so much of our discussion was about artist agency, and another big part of our discussion was about um, transparency, right? Like, how much does the public get to know? How much do artists get to know? How much do conservators get to know about the artist process, the museum protocols, the politics that are happening in the museum? So one of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit was what does transparency look like in our respective fields, not only for the museum, but for an artist working with the studio, for a conservator revealing their hand. What does that mean to you guys? I mean, I think for me, one of the impulses of the, one of the questions for the show was because it, the museum always just seems so unapproachable to actually be. We did that on purpose. Uh, yeah. but. <laughs> But as the artist museum, I thought that would be more approachable. But in a sense, it was mostly to think about um, how in school you never really actually learn how the work exists in a collection. And so, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about conservation and institutions, but somehow every time I've talked to a conservator before, they're always like, we're always trying to figure out what the artist's intention was. But then I was wondering, you know, while the, uh, while the artist is alive, why wouldn't you just ask them? And what happens when artist intention becomes in opposition to conservation or in opposition to the institutional idea of maintaining the, the integral idea from like the 80s or the 70s or whatever? Um, and so in a sense, uh, in the beginning of the show, I wanted to find works that were like terribly in a, very bad state and sort of contact the artist and be like, what, you know, you're about to die. So now that we have archival materials, do you want to remake it? And is that even possible? Because it would be best for the specific work because then it would live physically restored. The author would, st the idea wouldn't be compromised and the museum would have a solid, no? But then, you know, these questions were like, when some of those objects, um, like could an artist even, approach the institution and be like, you know, that work that I made 30 years ago is not what I actually wanted, can I change it? And of course, many of the answers is always no. And so I wanted to find out if in the collection there was instances in which artists had successfully negotiated with the museum or that the museum, you know, or that the author had planned for making the institution think about those things in the future and how you even thought about it. I can respond, but maybe you would like to respond no, as well. Okay. Um, you said about 12 things that I want to respond to, so <laughs> I have to choose carefully. Um, this question of transparency of, of museum information has bothered me a lot, because the entire time I was at MoMA, I was interviewing artists, and they were all over the place. Some would say, I will tell you this, but don't disclose it to the public. They want to black box their work, so they don't want, they want to retain some mystery. Um, so they might tell me how they made it, or how they shot it, how they edited it. Um, but they want the, the public to experience certain magic. Um, or there may be other copyright concerns that you know, they would share with us, um, but they don't necessarily want that to be public. Whereas other artists would say, oh, absolutely, you know, I want everything open. In fact, here's my source code. Please put it up on your website so other artists can download it and modify it and make their own works of art. Um, so, I, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot. And also, just working with artists, I've been thinking about this 
term that we use and you just referenced called artist intent. Um, and I think a lot of conservators um, think of it as something that it's like a, a faucet. You can turn it on and get it and then you know use it. But working with artists now for a number of years, I realized they're human beings and they may say one thing one day and <laughs> something else the next day. We're and human. <laughs> And uh, one artist that I interviewed said, I'd like you to interview me three different times on different days, because I will tell you different things, uh, you know, <laughs> different. I said, have you been reading anthropology? And he said, yes. <laughs> um, so it's just really interesting to me, and I'm still fascinated but by artists, the creative idea and the physical manifestation, and, and then artists' relationship with that over the years, and, and then what does the museum do with that? Right. You know, do we t try to freeze it and keep the work um, the way it was when it was originally entered to, in the museum, or do we allow it to change? And um, be interesting to hear you talk about right. that. Right. I think. I mean, I think the other thing, the inverse of artist's intent, maybe, is the idea, this idea of curatorial intent. Right. Like that, curators are not authorial voices. That we are stewards of art. That we are stewards of ideas and that we are simply translating it in some way what the artist does for the public. But um, more and more, I think it's becoming the case that people understand curators to be authors themselves and that they take liberties with things and they take um, a stance and have an opinion and um, own some sort of what's, some part of what's being on display. So I think in terms of this idea that um, we're always trying to make the artist's intent happen. Well, it's really always a collaboration. And I think there's some pieces in the exhibition that showcase this particular Felix Gonzalez Torres that we make decisions on behalf of the artist all the time. Um, not only when the artist's not around, but when they're there. And sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's not so positive or not so great. What if you disagree? What if you disagree? With the artist. With the artist. Um, I don't know. I think, I think I think it's a. I mean, I think that it's, you know, not a black and white of disagree or agree. I think that every collaboration between an artist, a curator, a museum, a conservator, and any other party, is a um, compromise. Well, it's like really dirty word now, but like it's a compromise. I don't know. <laughs> Let me put an idea out there, and and then the two of you can react to it. So I think that. The moment of acquisition is like a really important moment in the life of a work of art. Um, of course, most works of art are never acquired by museums, and they have pre-museum lives. And if the artist still owns it, they have complete right to do whatever they want to with it. They can completely change it. They can change the title. They can re-perform it in different ways. But at that moment of acquisition, parties come together and negotiate what this work is and what it will be in the future. And I think the artist is in a strong position to say, you can't have it unless I can come in every time you install it and paint it a different color. The museum can say, um, no, we can't afford to bring you in every time, maybe three times, and then we'll map you know, how you want it to be displayed. And then we're not going to bring you, fly you in in the future. But these negotiations happen at that moment of acquisition, and it's very hard for an artist to come back 10 years later and say, I'd like to paint it green or I'd like to change it. And I think that's where conflict can happen. OK. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to say because you know one of these questions was that I didn't have a side. I couldn't pick a side between the institutions because I understand why you have to maintain these works. But as an artist, I was thinking, through looking at all of these archaeological objects and how they have changed so much through the interpretation and time and reconstruction, everything, it's like the life of an artwork would be hopefully like a thousand years, let's say. You know, like antiquities are like that old, no? It's, it's well preserved, whatever. And so then if an artist can be alive as an adult, sanctioned enough to be able to make a decision over the life of this work for, let's say, like top 60 years, and if the life of the work is a thousand years, it's such a small amount of time that if I was like 90 and I decided to burn all my work at the end, I would at least be able to do that because for 940 years, somebody else will decide all those things. 
Right, but I think that the what I would say to that is that the museum, oh, right, wait, collects. <laughs> wait, oh, wait. <laughs> because collects Glenn, Glenn was talking about the moment of acquisition being uh, integral, a decisive, moment, a decisive right. moment. But in my opinion, the decisive moment is when artists die, because people are always like, when is the artwork actually finished? And then I think it's not when it leaves the studio or when it gets purchased, but when actually the author is not there anymore. Right. And I think what, so what we're actually talking about, what I would say you're talking about is two different models of collecting, right? Like one is the model that which 99.9% .9 museums subscribe to, which is that they are collecting objects. And curators or whoever is in charge of collecting goes out into, go out into the world and decide that at that moment that they're collecting it, it's a moment of culture, it's an object of cultural importance that deserves to be saved in the state it is in, right? Like, it's valuable at that, I mean, it's obviously gonna be valuable in other senses, but at that moment, that person, right, that authorial voice decided that this was an important, a, a, a culturally important object for its time that not only represents its time, represents its artist. What you're proposing by saying that the most important point is when the artist dies is that museums are in fact collecting artists, right, collecting a relationship with an you're artist. You're the artist museum. Right, and we can talk about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the next that. question. <laughs> but but I do think that that's a really interesting model of collecting. And I think that um, the idea that a museum creates, um, for lack of a better word, a roster of artists whose ideas of a, of a lifetime they're interested in, right, can be expressed that way so that you're, you know, you have a work as Glenn says, at that decisive moment, you say every five years I'm gonna come in and change this work, or every five years I'm gonna donate another work that's gonna continue, and you're obliged to do that. I mean, the artist has a lot of power at the moment that Glenn is deciding, but um, I do think there are alternative ways to collect, and it's something you and I have talked Does about. Does the artist have a lot of power? Because if you come up with some sort of crazy stipulation that the artwork needs to be maintained in the sense you'd be at your meeting being like, no way, that's a difficult piece, we can go and buy a painting or whatever that doesn't do anything like that. Right. So I think that in that moment, you might say that the artist has some sort of leverage to like decide the future of the thing, but in, in terms of like the power relationship of institution over artists and the way that you can actually you can't actually really control your own legacy within the institution because, I mean, look at even the models of collecting of the institution. That's not like I can be like, please take this one, more like you have picked one or something like that. There's not like every day an artist can come to the museum and be like, I want you to have this one, please take it. Right, but I think um, one of the things and is the specific versus the general, right? And, and the policy versus the um, anecdotal, right? And I think one of the things that we have tried to encourage in this show is not actual po like general policies that work for a broad spectrum of things, but rather to have dialogues about each specific object, especially in the case when you have an artist that's living and already involved in the museum and it's someone we know, to um, encourage this idea that what we, rather than say, what we usually do is this, and because we usually do this, we cannot accept this, it doesn't work for us. But to really test the parameters, right, being a museum of contemporary art where a lot of what we decide to acquire are gifted doesn't fall within these parameters, right? We're constantly reinventing the rules, or we'd like to try to constantly reinvent the, you know, rules is a bad word, but um, I think that's what one of the main points of this exhibition is, is that like, my job is actually to have a dialogue with you. And you know, I think, I, I still really do think that the moment of acquisition is really important for everybody to come together and just try to think through the future because that's when contracts are written and agreements oral or written are made. But I think in practice, um, many museums of contemporary art are much more flexible and having worked with contemporary art now for 20 years. Um, as I said before, I, I really have shifted the way I think about things and think about the relationship that artists have with their, with their artistic production and realize that many of them are still very much engaged in the works that they produced and may end up in museums. And I now have a much more sort of open and flexible um, approach 
to, to deciding you know, what the role of the artist is in the, in the ongoing life of their work in, in museums and would be much more open now to working with an artist to alter a work of art. Because I, I also think while the artist is alive, the work is still in its infancy if it's going to last a thousand years. Um, then you know that period of time is still it's a very young work of art and the artist might still be kind of working through those ideas and, and yeah I'm much more open now than I used to be to changing works. Um, going on that I think um, we've talked a lot about what the audience for this exhibition is right like who is this exhibition for is it for the public to know the behind the scenes um, sometimes drama of the museum. But I think that um, what it was really about, and Gallen can speak more to this, is about artists, right? Like the whole idea with this um, project, this open house project, was always to invite artists in, right? And, and to say, what, what, how do you use the museum, right? Like how can you use this permanent collection that we have that's mostly stored away? How do you think of it as a resource? So um, one of the things that was really important to Gallen, she can tell you more about this, that this is a show for artists. Yeah, I wanted to make a sort of shop talk show that it was more like if there was a class in school about how to m think about the longevity of your work from the beginning. That's why we have a catalog with all of these sort of contracts because I was like, I need to copy, paste, like delete information from there and just like scan it and like Photoshop my own information on it because the forms are not readily accessible to people. And so in order to just be prepared for that sort of thing, but what ended up happening to me, um, through the duration of planning the show, which was a year and a half of conversations with you and you, was that the audience sort of became more the people who work in the museum. Like you had to argue with people inside of the museum for so long, and I actually, we disagreed to begin with in so many things, and in a way you had to take my side when you presented it to other people. So in, that, in those conversations when I was actually thinking about all of these meetings that were happening where I didn't go, I was like, that is actually the public where for this exhibition, because you have to deal with how you are implicated in the life of this work specifically, and you are actually ones who are making decisions over it. Right. So what was it like inside the museum? Because I, I mean, first of all, I, <laughs> I love this catalog. I mean, I look through it, and this is the kind of stuff that I've been producing for museums for the last many years that I've been in, in the field. And it's always meant to be hidden. It's not meant to be open to the public. And right. here you like... I mean, it was a lot of being really nice to the registrars for a <laughs> while. You know, a lot of no. I mean, Gala loves to say that we started this exhibition with 50 objects and ended up with 14. And so, you know, there's 36... 75. 36 no's. 75. 36 no's in there somewhere. But um, there were a lot... I mean, it, for me, it was a lot of, as Gala says, trying to see things from the point of view of an artist and trying to understand um, how to work against what I've been taught as a curator and um, how to have dialogues on behalf of um, only artists' intent, right? Like, not think about how I would display it or how I would explain it or how I would go through the permanent collection to create an exhibition, but to think of like these really alternative ways. And, um, there are times that this exhibition was really unpopular within the, ex within the museum because we were asking people to go against their interests. I mean, one of the cases that was, I mean, and what, that Gal and I went back and forth a lot about was like, can you show pieces of art that have broken off other pieces of art, right? There's one on view. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but, can, well, yes, you can, but, not on my show, not on our show, but there is yes. one on view. Is that the best way to represent that artist, right? Like the artist doesn't have a say. We're deciding, you're now deciding to badly represent the artist, no. <laughs> I actually, when, I, when you invited to me to show, I've never curated a work before because I'm like the complete dictator over my studio and I can make all of the decisions. And then this is one of the things that I actually learned through making the exhibition was that, oh yeah, like I wouldn't want to have a work of mine in that show if I was an artist within it. Because right. the, the first, the first like, <laughs> trial of it was like works that are make sh made shittily, like terribly made works. And right. then I was yeah. like, oh my god, I would never <laughs> want to be in the show. You know what I mean? Exactly. We, we said, like, I know. You know. 
we're looking for things that are broken. We're looking for things that don't hold up well. We're looking for things, and that was a criteria that's really hard. And then the other thing was, um, we were never concerned about making a beautiful show. We were never concerned. It actually looks more beautiful than the original proposal because my idea was <laughs> that it would look like Home Depot, like just. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, I guess that was my. <laughs> me. Yeah, you're like, let's turn the light on. I was like, sorry. why does the light have um, to be on and outside of the box? Yeah. Like, put the box. So <laughs> I have a question for you as an artist. Um, what's on display? Are it's sort of like behind the scenes of the museum, and this catalog is very much behind the scenes of the museum in terms of documentation. Do you think that most artists have much of an idea of the kind of documentation that's in this catalog and the kinds of decisions that are made in museums and the, the um, yeah, I mean, what's on exhibit? Here? I mean, even, even when, like the, the artist interview, when a, a museum buys one of your works, you get this sort of survey of what you want the life of the work to be. But then I had never seen it before a museum bought one of my works. So I couldn't plan for those things while I was making the work. You know, I mean, all of a sudden, all of these questions, I still, it was so difficult to fill it out because when I was thinking about them, they became these really philosophical questions where it was like, what do you, and, and the survey was meant to be very practical, like, what is the, all of the materials, like what do you do when something falls off and all of these things, and I was like, actually, it's impossible for me to fill this out because I'm thinking about like, after I die, how would I want it to be? And I think that many of these anxieties came from actually looking at antiquities and also the way that like, the way that you see works in ethnographic museums or something is so far removed from what a potential uh, original idea or function or whatever had been um, that, for me to think about my work in those sen in those scales, time scales, was like a thousand years from now. I have no idea what kind of material or like, please replace with the paper of a thousand years from now. I don't even know if paper will exist. You know what I mean? Well, do you think, um, like, I think most art schools don't teach art students about longevity of materials or museum processes or even. You know, if you ever sell a work to a museum, here's what you're going to encounter, meaning questionnaires and interviews and like an information package on how to care for the work in the future. But if they did, would it kind of kill the creativity? Would it shift the focus too much towards I conservation? I think that, you know, at least when I went to school, it was so much about conceptual ways of framing things. We think about the institution, we think about all the context, but then if we don't think about the actual materials, it's like, disregarding so much other sections which information can be used. If you actually know the process of conservation and the technical material or whatever, you would actually be able to incorporate that into the conceptual framework of your work from the beginning or account it instead of being a default. Right, I think this idea that the museum is a black box, right? That works go in, you get a questionnaire, and that's it, that's your opportunity is not true. I think that we're more and more interested in having these dialogues at the onset, at that decisive moment that Glenn is talking about. And I think there are, I mean, there are artists who we tell them, you know, hey, we just acquired your work, and they're like, cool, thanks, you know? And then there's artists who want to be much more involved. But Can I, I switch it out for a better That's exactly one? What, what I was about to mention, is that this idea that, you have to remember that for a lot of artists who getting their first work in a museum means like, that work is going to be around forever. That's a huge, huge responsibility, right? Not only on behalf of the museum, but on behalf of the artist, that they are going to be represented in X way for the lifetime of this institution, right? And um, they might not have chosen that piece. Yeah. Most likely, they didn't choose that piece. That was not the piece that they wanted to to represent themselves. It could have come as an acquisition of what was available. The gallery could have wanted that piece to go to a museum. Um, it could have been a gift of a collector, right? And that collector would have bought something based on their taste, which is, just to let everyone know, the majority, and I'm sure you can figure this out, the majority of pieces that come into a museum are gifts. They're gifts of people who are giving work, so we don't actually get to decide. And there's that middleman creates a, diff a, a filter, right, between the artist and the museum. So what I would encourage or what I would say or one of the really important things to me is like artists should know when their work is going to the museums, when, when their collector is gifting that work and get in contact with that museum and talk about it and say, well, 
maybe we can work so that you get this gift and another one, or there's this other piece. And just like start having these dialogues and start feeling agency. Or right? more like, like just go to like art club with all your friends and gift each other one of your works and then all together gift it to you. <laughs> just be like, now can I gift other people's works? Just be like, Psh, have it. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so from my experience at MoMA, um, the older, more famous artists felt a lot more power and agency and felt like they could tell us what they wanted us to do with their works. And I think the curators and conservators were much more um, apt to give in to an artist's strong opinion if they were a famous artist. Because right. there's this fear that they'll, you know, they won't allow any more of their works into our collection. Whereas a younger artist, didn't feel that agency and didn't, um, and they weren't treated the same. Sure. Um, so I think that's that. In terms of the relationship of the artist with the museum, I think it very much has to do with the yep. the position of the artist in the art world. Absolutely. But I mean, thinking of wh while I was looking at the collection, it was also looking at all of the works that had been gifted of artists I actually know by. Um, collectors and I was like I know that artist doesn't want that work here you know what I mean and so then in a sense it's more like how is it that the must have been that the museum didn't actually call the artist because many of the works are like bought at the fair and then instantly donated to the thing I'm like what artist in the right mind would be like sending the ones that you want to be remembered for there I mean I think the thing to remember then is taking speaking of longevity is like wow that work right now might not seem like the best work for that artist. Like somebody made that decision, right? Somebody made that decision, that decision goes down the line. Curators made that decision. And sometimes what we hope most for objects is not that they're appreciated now and that we show it now and that it becomes you know, a hit now, but that some PhD student in 20 years goes back to rewrite something and wow, that piece actually is really important. I mean, the permanent collection is, about the people that are not in this room. You know what I mean? Like It's about the unknowable, in a way. Well, how much do you think curatorial authority should be eroded? I mean, because... None. <laughs> <laughs> Eroded. Because not traditionally, it was the, cu it's the, it's the curator. Museum. It's the arbiter that says, this is the most important work by this artist, and this is the one... I mean, you've just, said, you've just blown that myth away by saying, actually, most works come in are gifts, and... Um, you don't have full control, but anyway, at least there's a myth that the curator is the one that has the training, has the eye, the connoisseurship to say, this is the work that is going to be regarded as the most important in the future. Right. But what we're talking about Over here the opinion of the artist. Is that maybe like the, artist the curator would know better than the author themselves which one is the best work. That's the question. Who knows? Best. Yeah, we're both biased. I mean, the artist is biased as well. But one of the things that... Please tell me about my work. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have some? <laughs> um, I think one of the things that this alludes to is, does this model work, right? Like, this is a model, the idea of going out into the world, getting objects, bringing them back to an institution that's going to save them is a leftover from colonialism, right? It's the leftover from... Um, you know, plundering the new world in some way. And we, museums arose in the 17th and 18th century as people brought things back and put them on display and uh, wunderkammers. And um, it became a repository for goods, right? And um, that is a model that has stuck with us, right? And it's been a very effective model for keeping cultural tr heritage and treasure. But as Glenn alludes to, it prioritizes um, certain kinds of people and it um, reaps the benefit from certain kinds of gains. And I'm interested in new kinds of model. I don't have the answer to what the new model is, but I'm wondering if, you, if there's any you can think about, like, what is a different model by which institutions can keep cultural heritage while, respect, while, while not um, participating in that cycle? I've it's got a an deep answer. question. Me too. Rock, paper, scissors. Um, 
Well, I think definitely institution has a problem, but I don't necessarily know that getting rid of the museum altogether is a solution. Because that wasn't what I was supposed to do. Okay. No, but I mean, of course, first impulse is like get rid of the museum. But in a sense, it's like how, do, how can we find a compromise in keeping some sort of thing because museums are important for something, but they have this big problem. And I think that is sort of the institution looking realistically of how they exist and not pretending like there's no problems. Because I think that there's also, if the institution doesn't actually talk themselves about these problems, it's more likely like, I inherited these problems from like history 100 years ago or 18th century or whenever museums, then it sort of leaves the responsibility of the museum itself to deal with its own problems now. And it also creates an unrealistic expectation from the audience to be like, you museum need to do all of these things when you actually can't do that. So in a sense, it's more like be really transparent about what the museum is, dealing with these problems that you have, because it's not inherited problems. It's more like the institution is the people who are there alive today, no matter how brand new they are. So I've been teaching this course at NYU um, called Museums and Community. And really thinking about the role of museums in society um, as trusted institutions like libraries, um, as places where democracy can be practiced. And I think we're, we're living in a time where a lot of museums are really shifting the model um, from collecting and exhibiting to actually um, engage community in civic discourse to practice democracy. And museums can be a safe place to do that. And I think artists um, have a real role in that for museum programming where community members can come in and maybe do community-based curating or documenting or collecting um, and I'm seeing, I, I think that that's a real interesting model that a lot of museums are starting to adapt and, and um, a lot of contemporary art museums are also opening the doors. Transparency of documentation being one way, but right. also just having programming around, you know, activist, you know, political issues. Right, right. I mean, I think, you know, to go back to this idea of the artist museum for one second, I, you know, I don't 100% know what that means, and I think it's a weird mantle to carry as a museum because I think any museum in the country would argue that they are an artist's museum, that they listen to the artist, right? That they take their cue from the artist. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a weird mantle to carry because we're always trying to dice, dice, decipher what that means, and um, there's a plaque out on the plaza that says the artist museum that was put there by, I forgot right now, someone else knows. Um, that is left there as much as, not as a prize, right? Like they won this prize, but as a, as a you know, caller to say like, okay, now what are you gonna do every day to make this happen? And I think, um, you know, artist curated exhibition is nothing new, but I think when it was my turn to say like, okay, last year was our 40th anniversary, what do we do? How do we celebrate it? How do we, I don't have an answer for how to celebrate the, <laughs> the museum and the complex history of this museum, but I can turn to an artist and say, what do you think? And that's what I did, you know? I did 50 studio visits with different artists and I asked, how do you use the museum? Because I don't, I don't know any other way, right? Like, I don't know any other way to enact that other than to ask rather than tell. Um, and I wish I could ask more. But I mean, I think the, the artist museum that you're talking about in the plaque comes from the, or, the origin of this specific institution, because all of the museums, even though they might take into account what the artist is thinking, et cetera, you know, all museums end up having different types of personality. And so when looking at MOCA and the history of how the museum actually started, I feel like that um, uh, inclusion of like artists having way more say on how the building is actually run doesn't really exist so much anymore. So not necessarily that, it would be like a temporal thing, you know, like we curated a show together, but I'm not gonna be like making decisions. I'm not invited to even think there's no uh, embedded sort of discourse that is continuous, no? And, and I also do think that um, it's, it's sort of like reflective of these sort of changes. 
I think we talked about it, there's like, even though there's like more exhibitions that are being artist curated, it's not actually reflected until it is actually part of the permanent collection. Like if it's just the shows that rotate on top, it doesn't actually change what the building itself is, which is the permanent collection. Right, I think, I think people would argue both for both sides, the, the museum institution, the, or the identity of the institution being the permanent collection or the identity of the institution being the community activism it does, the exhibitions that it puts on that are uh, reflections of the times. I think you could argue both ways. Um, what I would say in this case, right, like what are the lasting effects of an exhibition like this on museum policy? I mean, I'm a curator, I'm relatively young. Um, I will hopefully continue this profession for many years going forward. And I know um, that the way that I think about collecting and the role of the permanent collection has changed. I have had dialogues with all of my curator colleagues in this institution, younger and older, about the ramifications of this exhibition. And some of them have it's inspired a lot of thought, um, some positive, some negative in some ways. And I think that as you and we have pointed out, the museum is a living body full of people and those people are constantly changing and, and you know, I think that um, the pool of curators is very small, like we talk to each other. So, um, but I actually, one of my favorite works that is not on view, I think is one of the works, is one of the works that we disagreed on and it was not on view, but it was realized for me in the object file for the future curator who will actually see that work when all of these people rotate out. And then when they want to pull out that piece again, there is a note saying these curators in 2019 didn't like the way that the artist wanted it to be. So now you, as a new set of curators, will know that this was not the artist's intention, and you need to figure out whether you will take the artist's side or your own side. So I'm hoping that in the future, that's like a... Is this something you embedded in the uh, so we, no. just to explain, file? It's being, you're being so nebulous about it. Like oh. it's, um, <laughs> <laughs> it, so there was a, a proposal to do something to an artwork um, to change it, right? Like To melt it. Well, let's not be specific okay, so we don't call it the artist. <laughs> um, and I so actually flew to New York to talk to Glenn. The first time I met Glenn, because there's no conservator on staff here, so I was like, who is the top conservator in the country? If I can convince him, it will trickle down. Right, I'm not sure I'm the top <laughs> so, so, So the artist proposed to change their work that we had collected in the past and do something new with it. Um, this was, there was a lot of back and forth. We entertained a proposal from them. We discussed the proposal over a series of meetings with the curatorial department, and in the end, we decided against allowing the artist to melt the work. Um, because of a series of factors, which I can go into or not, but in the end what happened is that proposal and the recording of the dialogue that we had about the work is now part of the permanent object file of the work. So as Gala says, at some point in the future, those people who we do not know, that future curator might go into the object file and say, wow, now is the time to realize this proposal that came in in 2019 and Brian said no. Not you, I, it, not you, <laughs> all of you said no. Yeah, all of us said no. <laughs> you know, um, all anyway, I, th I think we've reached our uh, 50 minute mark, so we wanted to leave time for Q&A, um, because we hope that there is some. Uh, Otherwise, we could go on and on. Yeah, and on. we can really talk about this for a long time, but um, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, they're going to give you a mic. Super interesting. I feel like there's an assumption baked into the conversation at some points that including more space for authorial intent in a collection would make the museum more democratic. But I feel like, at least in literature, for example, like authors don't get to control the interpretation of their work, and they can also so like their control of the future of the piece could also be authoritarian in the same way that the museum's collecting practice could be. So, what do you think about that, Gala? Like People are like Kafka, and if he, we followed his thing, we wouldn't know. And I was like, I would actually prefer that as an author, that my work would not be seen, and that people wouldn't know about this book, because then at least I don't feel guilty reading it every time. Thank, thank you for, uh, both for your, your uh, comments and thoughts. Um, I have a question for Gala. Yeah. In terms of the role and power of the artist in the institution. Two cases come to mind, Katie Nolan disavowing her log cabin sculpture and Richard Prince disavowing his 
she shall not be named daughter of the president painting George. recently, but as a political protest. Yeah. So w I was just curious about your thoughts about the artist and disavowal. I think that in terms of artist disavowal, France is the place to be <laughs> because it's all a legal way. There are some places where you can't actually do that. And so then in a sense, I actually have been reading a lot about the law lately. And so just to, um, because the way that I've been thinking about these contracts that allow people to do that is that it's meta sculpture. So as sculpture people, like as artists, we go in the studio and decide all of the parameters of how the material and the whatever will exist. But the law is actually doing that with every single thing, like people act this way, materials are like this, or whatever, whatever. So in a sense, if, um, I don't know if I can answer your question, but, but more like how to make policy that would be more open to possibility of doing that, you know? And like Glenn said, it's, it's just being more aware of what the contract limitation will do in the moment that institutions or whatever get sold. But if you have no idea what to expect, it could just be like, I, I mean, I'm thinking like a line in the contract that says like, I can change my mind whenever I feel like, but then, you know, your galleries would be like, no way, you know? <laughs> so, so this is moral rights legislation, which is a, 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 a division of copyright legislation, which varies from country to country and even from state to state in the United States, giving artists rights over the disposition of the work. Um, but all of that is superseded by a contract. So the artist, if the artist signs a contract saying you can destroy the mural I'm painting on, my, on, on your wall in five years, then they've given up that right to litigate. But there's also some loopholes. Who was that guy that was like, um, didn't like the way that his work was sold or whatever, and then he made like a hundred of them to be like, okay, you sold it, I can just remake it, and then make a hundred of them and bust that piece. Ah? What guy? So loophole if they don't let you. <laughs> a lot of this conversation seemed to revolve around kind of institutional memory, attempts to affix things, especially as actual people come in and go. Um, I'm wondering, especially in regard to the exhibition and as you put it together, if there were ever kind of encounters with like or you tried to find f forgetting that had occurred and how you worked around that? Forgetting what? Just like sort of if you, if you ever speculated about forms of like institutional forgetting um, as sort of like the flip side to these like forms of memory. There is actually, maybe not forgetting, but there's like actually a work that maybe forgetting can be like loss of information not on purpose, but there is that John Chamberlain uh, urethane work that is falling apart, but then the museum actually doesn't know if that was intentional or not. So they can't actually preserve it because maybe it was meant to decay on purpose, but because there's no information, I guess it's just like left to fall apart. And that's why it has the vitrine on it because it's like trying to slow down that process, which is kind of funny, because it's not going to be possible. Right. I mean, I think th I'm really trying to envision what institutional forget. Like, it's a really interesting phrase, like, what is institutional forgetting? When you lose the documents. Yeah. Well, there's so many times that we, s well, I think what I, what I would say is, like, there's so many times that we say, this is the way we do things, right? This is, and, you know, this is the way museums do things, right? So is there a way of thinking of like institutional forgetting of saying there are new models, right? There's a different way and we're actually, I know we did it that way, but we're gonna, not, we're not gonna think of it that way or we're gonna um, ignore that last time that we did it that way and do it another way. And so much of the identity, the DNA of what a museum is is about carryover and about um, establishing procedure that it's really, I think really hard to think about it like actually um, we're going to lose information, or we're going to. So it's it's an interesting thought. I, I'm just trying to, as you said, it envision what it looks like. But that's also like totally Glenn's question. Like you deal with like all the loss of information. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's the, all the forgotten bits. Like how do you even put that together? I don't even know. Yeah, I mean, Projecting. I can't tell you how many times I wish that I had like more information about what the artist would have wanted or what you can what, contact the afterlife. what was that last restorer thinking or uh, yeah you'll be available yeah, <laughs> <of course. laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so that, that's why I'm all about documentation. And there, there's now a, a movement in our field for conservators even to be documenting their intention and why they made the decisions that they did um, um, just to help answer questions in the future. I think one other way that it might come into play, this idea of forgetting, is like when you're working with artists who are no longer alive, right? Like I'm, I'm organizing a show of someone who died. And I think the first six months of the time was like, I have tried so hard to recreate the circumstances of their life and their intention and what they would have wanted. And I'm sure there are many of us who try to do this with many aspects of our lives. Um, but at some point, you have to be like, I'm never going to know. I'm never going to know. I'm just going to have an authorial voice and take a gamble. And it might have been wrong, but like that's the responsibility that I'm taking on um, in choosing this project. Um, so I, that might be a kind of forgetting, like a willful forgetting. Um, you asked a really challenging question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, this fascinating conversation. I wondered, Gala, if you could speak a bit more to the criteria used in the, the final selection uh, and perhaps to the limitations of the collection that you found uh, and how that affected your selections. One of the things I noted upstairs and discussed with the, uh, with the guard was that um, there doesn't seem to be a broad gender representation yes. in the exhibition, for instance. And I wondered if... That was actually one of the first conversations that I had with Brian after looking through the collection was like, I am limited to the amount of material that is here and I'm going to end up with a whole dude show. Because there's no, I'm like, are ladies like just making better technical work or what? Because there's no, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I never picked through all of these criteria, but then in the end, it turned out to be like all these people that I would never actually pick myself, <laughs> just because of the, the, so the way that the show was picked was um, looking at objects that were contingent on something outside of themselves to be maintained. So like chocolate being available or pollen being available or the author themselves being alive and available to make the work. Or what's the fourth one? There's another one. Four contingent works. And then the other, the other criteria was just looking through the storage unit about what were the things that were not art yet like materials that were waiting for some part of the sculpture to go to decay to become sculpture and also materials that had been sculpture before that now were in, still in the collection like X sculpture uh, and then the other ones were just uh, these technical things like the film you know there's a reel and then you would actually as an audience never actually see that film itself because it has to be like made into a copy and I was like trying to convince them to like actually screen it only once and they're like if we screen it it's going to fall apart so then it's like locked in this material box and then the other one was like Felix Gonzalez Torres has amazing contracts I mean there was no other sort of artist that had the incredible foresight materially to be like you as an institution like even with light doesn't exist. Like, it's so open-ended that way that... Right. I, 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 there's two, there's a really an interesting answer to that comment that you made that uh, one is more pragmatic and one is more interesting, I think. One is that, as I said before, most of the work comes in as gifts, right? Yeah. So historically, people who have the funds to buy art, what kind of art are they buying, sure. right? Let's start there. And what kind of art are they gifting to the museum, right? Second of all, um, another pragmatic thing is that when we were looking through the artists to make the show, we weren't really looking at the artists' names. <laughs> we were looking at the materials that were in the artwork. It was very seldomly that we were looking yeah. for an artist. And it was only after we had chosen all the artists that we realized that the, rep the level of representation was bad. And I think that also might be really interesting in the sense that maybe it was because men were more, white men were allowed to take more chances with their art, right, and still be collected, and white men were able to make these gestures that were like, it might work, it might work, it might, but I'm a great artist, so do it, and you know, it's a great piece of art. And women and people of color weren't afforded those chances as much systematically to create ephemeral works or to create conceptual works or to create works that might degrade. So. Um, that was something that sort of emerged after, but it wasn't a, um, it was something that we were conscious of, but we couldn't get around it in a way because it was so much about materials, you know? Um, 
So earlier in the conversation, I think, Brian, you just really quickly said that a uh, kind of potential iteration of the show would just be uh, things that were broken. Um, and I think the relationship between something that's broken and an artwork that's variable or evolutionary in some way is really interesting. Um, where is the line? How do we define something as either one of those categories? And I wondered if any or all of you could maybe comment on that or how that maybe played a role in your organization of the show. What the, the trees? How many yeah, leaves I mean, of the, the tree yeah, have the, to lose this is the, We keep tree? asking this question is like, how many pieces of a Paul McCarthy tree have leave fall out before it's no longer a Paul McCarthy tree? Right, like <laughs> when it's not the piece itself, when the remnants become more than the piece itself. I don't. I mean, I think that's like a, one of those like, does a tree fall in the forest? Do you hear it? Kind of questions. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think there's a line that I could even begin to try and draw. I think that um, it's a it's a like as you point out, it's a moving um, line, and I've seen cases where. I can say that piece was not installed correctly. No, I'm not saying here. Uh, like, the piece was installed incorrectly, or that wasn't a piece that the, I mean, there's museums right now that are having issues, as you pointed out, of art artists have disavowed a work, and yet they're deaccessioning it and selling it as if it work, right? Well, the artist has said that's not a work. You continue to act like it is. Um, You're doing that with the dove. Yes, we are doing that with the dove, but we're not treating like an artwork. In a way. It came out with gloves, like it was like we're, trash. We're, but you're like, we're not trying to sell it. It's, it okay. We're putting it on display to say this is an XR work. Let's not ally those two things for a second. That's really dangerous. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Maybe well, as a conservator, he could give you a more interesting. I can say that that was the, at, really at the heart of many of the interviews that I did with artists at MoMA, because what I was trying to do, I mean, I would always start with how did you shoot it, how did you edit it, or what should the performers wear, or what kind of light levels, you know, um, should it be, or what kind of... So I, I was trying to define the variability um, from the point of view of the artist to allow curators to interpret the work in the future. Um, but then we were also sort of saying, well, what happens if this breaks, or if, you know, this happens, or they're no longer making that kind of monitor, or we have to you know, recompile the software to function on new operating systems. And so we were trying to um, provide answers for questions that would be asked in the future, and we never, we didn't know what those questions would be. And I always felt like people are going to be wishing that we'd asked this, and we didn't quite get there, but it's like between the lines. And it, so it was a real struggle to try to predict, um, yeah, what kind of questions would there be in the future. Especially I think with one, technology art. Yeah. One of those works that I think about a lot is the Nanjun Paik uh, television sculpture stack that is at the Samsung Museum. And I'm like, you have <laughs> a television company. And it's off because it's not been updated. And so that in a sense, that, that sculpture in that building is so exemplary of that, where it's like the artwork is actually dead. And you're in a, you know. <laughs> Artwork is dead. Um, <laughs> is there any more questions? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm curious as to because uh, you started a little bit early on about uh, how you guys are collecting um, objects 99.9% .9 of the time. So uh, and like culturally significant objects, if that. So I'm curious uh, when does like a culturally significant object like trump the will of an artist like is that your call to make like in saying that the piece is not going to be trashed or melted or double negative double negative yeah i think i think that's the crux of what we're trying to figure out right. with this show i think that's the, the the very you know the quintum of the problem is that um how much we have the benefit of having living artists with us you know like Someone who works at an Egyptian museum, or someone who works, you know, at an Egyptian museum, museum of Egyptian artifacts or ancient artifacts, they have these problems, but they're they're totally different. They don't have at all 
like the lifetime of the artist with them or lived in the same lifetime or tried to understand the same, you know, it's almost impossible to understand the context in which that person lived and made that object. But double um, negative. Yeah, I mean, right. I think that we nego I think it's a negotiation. I don't think that there's a point at which it trumps. I think that we rely on a set of skills and a set of um, on a set of expertise, right? Like, of we see so many objects in the world. We're um, constantly surveying the field. We've been trained in the history of the of the field um, that we make an educated decision. And, and but we. When available, what we try to do is consult the artist, right? Like that's what we would want to do is try to consult the artist or the estate, which is something we haven't really talked about in this discussion. But like, you know, if you're an artist and you you really should be careful about who you're leaving your work to, because um, they're going to be making decisions for you for a much longer time than you are able to make decisions about your work. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to say there's a point or there's an inf there's an inflection point where it becomes something else. It's about that negotiation. Double negative? Yes. So, you know, double negative is double like neg a perfect example because, you know, the, the original purpose of that work was to decay over time, you know, land art or whatever. But then now Michael Heitzer is publicly trying to fundraise to conserve it. So he's actually going against his own idea of land art and making it go away for some sort of conservation thing. So in a sense, the museum is actually preserving the original intent of that work that is supposed to go away even against the artist's will. So in that sense, it's like, do we let him do that? But the museum, you know, like, has anybody told Michael Heiser that he can't actually conserve it because MoCA owns it? Maybe we take uh, one or two more questions and then we wrap up. I, I do want to say, though, that the, when we talk about contracts, we're not talking about the contract between the donor and the museum. Like, the donor would never, ever have a say in the manifestation of that artwork, right? Like, we're not looking to the donor or the collector to give us the information about what the piece should be. I've, I've never experienced that in my time collecting in a museum. If they paint over the work right, where they Right, if they paint it, if their, you know, the cat hair on the work from their house has become more than the work itself. But I, I understand what you're saying. Like, new contra contracts are a format that is by their very nature are prejudiced towards wealth, right? Or legal contracts. Um, I think that it, it's hard for, it, I, I think it's a valid point. I just think it's hard to think because I think when we say contract, they're not incredibly technical legal documents that we're signing about the works. More often than not, it's a set of instructions. And this is something that goes back to the idea of what's taught in art schools as well. Like, there should be a class in art schools that says, like, write instructions on how to do your work if you're not here. Because it, when I say the word contract, it's not, it's not really like always like a legal contract that says point A, that it's instructions, it's pictures, it's communication, it's like very simple communications at times. So while I agree with you that the idea that like writing something in stone is something that is also built on this idea of who can afford to um, have the legal help, but um, 
maybe Glenn can say something. Well, just in my experience, um, the contract is a, a pretty short document, usually specifying the uh, you know amount of money that was paid about the, and there may be some copyright information in there about use of images, about um, loaning the work, about whether like a media work can be shown in two places at the same time. But it, it's the thick documentation that is built um, during this acquisition phase, including the, the questionnaires, the interviews, the, um, so it's really, I mean, and from my experience in museums and knowing a lot of museum staff, um, everyone is trying to bend over backwards, honoring what the artist wants. But, I, but in the end, I, I know you're right, that there, there is a uh, hierarchy of power, and most frequently the artist is on the bottom end of that. Right. I would also recommend that you look through the, the brochure if you get a chance, because I think you'll see the gamut of like a Felix Gonzalez contract, which is very much like a lawyer contract, and a handwritten note from someone like Dove Bradshaw. You know what I mean? Like, I think it runs the gamut of what you'll find in these object files um, as to how that information is conveyed. All right, we'll take one more, and then we'll. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a contradiction to have a contemporary museum with a permanent collection. It's like, I think that the, the, the what were we talking about? That if you have a permanent collection, then, because I was also looking at like, what is the oldest work that MoCA has? No? And then in a sense, just like, if you want to have a contemporary museum in your, co in, if you want to also have a permanent collection, it needs to have like a back hall where stuff exits. <laughs> <laughs> The no longer contemporary back hole. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> On that note. On that note, um, thank you guys all for coming. We appreciate it.